Yes, it's like I'm panning for gold for the publisher. Yes. How do you get a book contract? How do you figure out the topics? How do you know what's going to sell and how do you negotiate that contract? Mark Gottlieb is one of the top literary agents in New York City. So assuming you've gone through some other steps of, you know, having written a manuscript in full, if it's fiction or if it's nonfiction, chances are you've done a book proposal with a couple of sample chapters. You've then gone out on submission, found an agent. The agent has procured a, a book publishing deal for you. Um, once you've accepted an offer, at that point, a publisher is going to be uh, presenting you with a contract for your, your initial review before signature. Can we take a step back? And for many people, the getting the contract is that first hurdle, I guess for all of us, that's the, that's the first hurdle. So maybe we can talk about that and then move into the negotiation and how do we get the best deal? Probably an author has at that point signed with an agency, you know, they probably signed an agency agreement and the agent has prepared their work for submission. They've gone out on submission to various editors at different publishing houses. Uh, hopefully they've been able to, you know, secure an offer or multiple offers as the case may be. And what the agent will do or should do is negotiate the terms of each of those offers to the best of their abilities to see how much a publisher is willing to offer in the way of, for instance, a book advance and royalties and the other terms of the agreement, such as the territories, you know, the book will be published in and where the rights will be situated. And so all of this will kind of flow from a, a deal memo that the agent were to present to the offer for, for their uh, consideration, you know, whether or not they wanted to accept that offer. You mentioned having an agent and of course you're a literary, literary agent. Is, is it really necessary if I'm, if I'm an author and I'm going out, I've written a book and now I, I want to sell that book is, is a literary agent essential? If an author wants to be published in a very big and meaningful way, then yes, a literary agent is essential because most book publishing houses, authors will find if they call the main line, it'll be like getting hit with a customer service line, basically. And it, it will explain that these book publishers do not accept unsolicited submissions unless they come by way of a literary agency. And part of the reason for that being is a lot of these publishing houses, the editors who work there, the publishers who, who work there, do not really want to work with an author who's kind of wet behind the ears. They rather work with an agency that has experience, that has established a good contract and a good report with the publisher and can help steer the author through the publishing process. Now, there are some maybe much smaller publishing houses who are probably used to hearing from some authors directly, but I can't really promise that that will always be a very lucrative you know, publishing experience for an author, or that it will, um, you know, really just result in a good publishing experience at all. So I think, again, if an author wants to go into major trade book publishing and be with a place like perhaps a big five publishing house or a larger independent publishing house, then really the, the way to go is through an agency. Has it always been that way? Or is this a more recent development? I think for a very long time, it has been that way. But I think a lot of this is a result of how big these publishing companies have grown to. It used to be that there were very, very many book publishing companies. It was almost like a cottage industry where it was just tiniest of publishers everywhere. And then over time, these big conglomerate publishers like Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, Hachette, even uh, Macmillan, St. Martin's Press, began, began buying up these small publishing companies. And so you had these companies that went from perhaps 50, 100 employees to many thousands of you know, employees. And so they can't really hear from people um, you know, just by picking up the phone when an author kind of cold calls. How can an author find the right literary agent? You must have solicitations all the time. How do you decide which author you want to represent? 
you know, an author and seeking out a literary agent, one of the things they can do is certainly visit the, the website of the literary agency, read up on the agency, read up on the agent, uh, they read their company bio, look at the kinds of books they're publishing. That will give you a sense right away. Obviously, read their uh, submission policies. Another good thing to do is their deal reportings online. For instance, Publishers Weekly has a has a great uh, deal reporting section where they limit it to just the, the six biggest deals of the week. There are other websites like Publishers Marketplace, which kind of had humble beginnings as a publishing blog and um, became basically a publishing Rolodex. And now a lot of deals are announced there. You can see the rankings of agents and agencies there. And it breaks the uh, information down into, you know, what kind of books they're doing, uh, how recently, for how much money, and uh, their contact information is there. So authors can go through uh, websites like that and basically see how the agencies stack up and know who they want to reach out to. On the agency side, yes, we're, we're getting inundated with submissions and queries every day. So really, how do we boil it down? Um, probably two ways. One is, obviously, I'm going out into the world and looking for, for authors. Uh, part of that is reading widely on online, reading news articles, staying up on, on things, what's going on on social media and things like that, and reaching out to people who I think should write a book. At the same time, people reach out to us. And then as a part of that, um, and we talked about this in the previous show, I, I really look at the author's platform to see um, if there's a big enough platform there, if they have a big enough reach to uh, be published in a meaningful way, because what's attractive to publishers, for instance, is an author who might have like a huge newsletter list or a social media following in the hundreds of thousands or, or millions, because publishers just see that as a built in audience. You're looking then, correct me if I'm wrong, you're looking for at least two characteristics. One, obviously the caliber of the book, the quality of the book, but number two, do, is that author in a position to command sales, to drive sales of that book? Certainly in the world of nonfiction, the platform is, is very central. It's oddly enough, since we last spoke, I'd say, become, starting to become even more important in the world of fiction, which is the strangest thing to me because you read a, a fiction book and you think to yourself, well, this author must have become a, a brand or a household name by extension of just the quality of their writing, which of course goes without saying, but more and more publishers are looking for those bells and whistles. Like did a writer come out of a prestigious uh, writing program? Do they have an MFA? Did they attend such and such workshop or conference? And what, what kind of uh, role do they play within the literary community? So in a sense, that's almost like what their platform is. So a writer comes to you says, take a look at my book. You, uh, you do an initial filtering process to see, does this make sense at all? You maybe do a little bit of background research about the author. Uh, it appears that might be, might be a good book and the author's got some followers or, uh, you know, on social media, some that platform as you describe, what's the next step? I've evaluated the work and the author themselves, you know, and I, I would reach out to the author in probably a phone call and, you know, offer representation. And if there's any work that I think the manuscript could benefit from, we might have an editorial discussion about how to sort of improve the work itself. In the case of a nonfiction book, we probably will look at something like the, uh, the author's um, book proposal book proposal and see if there's a way to kind of finesse that a bit. Um, oftentimes, that's just a matter of showing the client examples of what I feel is a very strong nonfiction proposal. And I just show them proposals I've sold uh, to publishers to work off of. Uh, and then from that point on, yeah, I just explain to them what the, the deal making process will look like, uh, you know, the submission process and leading up to the deal making process. I'll basically say that the client, you know, assuming the manuscript or the proposal is ready to go to publishers, then I will craft a pitch, a list of editors along a submission. I'll present that to the client. 
uh, so they can see and if they have any feedback. And then I would go out on submission, field offers from publishers, negotiate to the best of terms, and hopefully present the client you know, with an offer or, again, multiple offers as the, the case may be. So your initial role is, from the publisher's standpoint, your initial role is filtering, finding authors who have the appropriate characteristics or pieces in place in order to create a successful book. Is that a correct way to put it? Yes. It's like I'm panning for gold for the publisher. Yes. It's a great way to look at it because it's, it's you're right, it's a gatekeeper or an initial filter that publishers need because they they would be too inundated otherwise. You have found this author, you've uh, accepted them, you think that there's a good chance that they can get uh, a contract, that you can help sell them, uh, sell a contract on their behalf. You have given the author feedback. Everything is now in place. What happens next? So assuming I've procured an offer for the the author, and what I've done at that point is I've negotiated with the publisher. I've basically gotten to the publisher where the point with the publisher where we have a final offer to present the client. And the kinds of things you'll typically see in the way of those deal terms are a book advance, which is a large lump sum of money the publisher pays for the chance to publish the book. Typically, they pay that in halves, but sometimes they... They pay it maybe on signing, delivery of the manuscript, you know, publication, um, just to help their cash flow. And that's an advance against royalties. So the publisher, in addition to paying the advance, they pay money on the back end after the advance has earned out. So um, it's kind of like um, a bank you can borrow money from, never have to pay back if, God forbid, the book doesn't live up to our expectations. But the point we all want to get to is you sell so many copies of your book that in you earn your advance back in the number of copies sold, and suddenly then you're making money on the back end in royalties, a percentage on every book sold. And that percentage is different in terms of the format, various formats of the book. Um, so those are sort of the two main terms people really look at. Obviously, there are other things in the contract like You know, we, we, for instance, never let the publisher have the film and TV rights to the book. We always try and help the client properly exploit those rights directly. Uh, Which territories is the book going to publish in? Is it publishing in the English language here in the United States, throughout the world, or more languages than one? Um, Basically, things like that. I can go into more details in terms of, you know, what an author might expect in a deal memo, but... Those are some of the major deal points. The, you know, they're going to put in the delivery date of the manuscript in there. They might put in their intended publication date and format. They might put in something there like um, you know, they want to have an option to look at the author's next book before anyone else does so they don't have to compete with other publishers. They'll put those sorts of things you know, into an offer uh, or a deal memo. We all read about these enormous multi-million dollar advances. I imagine that for us mere mortals who are not nationally or internationally famous and we're writing professional nonfiction books, that those advances are much smaller. Can you give us a sense, any idea of, of what kind of advances might a, a professional author, a nonfiction author, author receive? The world of nonfiction is going to be different than the world of fiction. Fiction advances tend tend to go for more money because the, those books sell in in bigger numbers. Nonfiction books, I would say, non celebrity nonfiction can sometimes sell in the low to mid six figures on the high end. But you know, we've also seen it climb into. I mean, we did a book. I can't say for which author, but it. You know, a book deal, uh, it was just shy of a million dollars, uh, nonfiction book on the history of capitalism. So there are books which do sell for a lot more money sometimes in the nonfiction space. And certainly if you're a celebrity in the nonfiction space, the advances start to look, you know, much different. Um, In the world of fiction, it can be all over the place, really, depending on the book. But generally speaking, 
the advances will tend to go for more than the nonfiction. Um, but things change in the world too. Um, sometimes there's more of a demand among publishers for nonfiction, depending on what's going on in the marketplace. As an author, what can I do to shape my entire package from myself to my platform to my manuscript in order to try to drive a higher or command a higher royalty? Because obviously if I'm writing a book, you know, I care about that for, for many of us. There's a few things. Obviously, first and foremost, you have to have written a great book. It's got to be a fantastic idea, unique idea, you know, or a new take on something, and it's got to be well written. Of course, that goes without saying. After that, you want to accompany, you know, one or two sample chapters with a book proposal, uh, which basically goes into some of the specs of how you envision the book, how, um, you know, what your platform is like, how you might potentially see the book marketed and promoted. And if you can make a really good presentation, both with that and probably your, your initial, you know, query letter or submission letter, eventually it'll be the agent's pitch, but um, you'll stand a very good chance of increasing your chances. I would say though, the biggest thing, and we talked about this the last time we spoke is really that author platform. So obviously it's very simple. Like uh, if you have a, uh, a, let's say you have a following in the millions, that's a no brainer for publishers. They know they can publish that book and it'll be like printing money. But, Let's say you don't have a following like that. You, an author would then have to sort of lend the perception or show a publisher that through their outreach, they can really build a platform around themselves. Uh, and they would have a, a community basically to really come together and support the book. And sometimes in those cases, publishers are willing to kind of take the bait and you know, publish such a book for feeling that there could be a platform there. So there's a selling effort and a packaging effort that the author needs to undertake to position the book as you would position any other product before a consumer to entice them. Is that a, a correct way to put it? Basically, yeah. It's making you know the food look really good on the plate. It's that presentation. Um, and I would say... Uh, that's a very, very big part of it. I mean, just because of, I mentioned how inundated we are, you know, we get many queries by way of email throughout the day. Uh, I can only imagine how many through the weeks, months, and years, but um, publishers are having the same experience. And so you want to kind of grab their attention right away. And I would say as much as possible, really be kind of throwing numbers in the eyes of publishers. That's really what excites them. When you say throwing numbers, you mean things like numbers of followers and how many of these books can I sell? Yes. Like if you say to a publisher, for instance, I do speaking engagements across the country throughout the year to hundreds, if not thousands of attendees, a publisher who hears that will get so excited because what they're thinking then in their mind is, okay, this author has their book on on a stand, on a table, on stage next to them. They're talking about their book or after their show, you know, they're signing copies of their book. They see that right away as a built-in audience and, and a, a means to, to sell the book. It wasn't always that way. Probably before my time in publishing, publishers were really the muscle behind getting books marketed and promoted. But again, over time, as these publishers kept getting bigger and bigger, and they're still getting bigger and bigger, Peng, uh, Penguin Random House is in the process of acquiring Simon & Schuster, and the government you know, considers it a big antitrust issue, and they're investigating it. Um, but uh, you know, publishers now, their, their attitudes are kind of fewer, bigger books. So they're focusing on acquiring fewer books, but publishing them in a bigger way, and sort of the mid-list of books is bottomed out, and these Smaller books or even mid midless books at publishing houses, debuts and newer books are, it's very hard for them to get attention if they're not already a best-selling author. So the publishers rely so much on authors who can basically be a sales engine for their own book. 
We have a, a very interesting question from LinkedIn and Karen Scott asks, if you're a first time author, what are some tips to entice attention from an agent? Two things. If you're a fiction author, like we said, quality writing, you know, a really good query letter too will go a long way. I think a good query letter is upfront in one to two sentences, what the book is about sort of that hook or that quick pitch. Because again, think of the experience of agents and editors. They're getting so many submissions. The email needs to grab them right away. I think maybe part of that quick pitch, mentioning a couple of comparative titles, basically books the author feels in some way are similar to their book, published within the last five years, and were really successful books to really hold yourself in high esteem because people are thinking, Where's this book go on my list? Where might it go in a bookstore? How well might it do? And then I think a couple body paragraphs about the book and the last paragraph of your letter about you as the author, your relevant writing experience, writing credentials. If you're a nonfiction author, really showcase your platform there. And I think all of that makes for a wonderful presentation to agents. And I'm assuming that you must get lots of pitches and publishers where let's just say things are embellished and how much do you scrutinize and how much do the publishers scrutinize those numbers and those sales assumptions some publishers can yes yeah, sort of read between the lines on that other publishers say to themselves you know what if these people really do come through and support the book like the author says they have relationships with these people then it could be a meaningful publication. It's, you know, some of it is a little bit like black magic. I mean, obviously the type of work I do is not an exact science. You know, I work, I work in the arts and I can't even tell you how many times an author who had a massive platform who is easy to settle, sell to a publisher, sometimes it doesn't pan out the way that a publisher predicted. And then to think of it in opposite terms for a moment, how many times where perhaps an author had a smaller uh, platform and advance from the publisher, but the book became a massive success almost out of thin air. Uh, you know, I, I, it's really not an exact science and so much of it is just where, where that spark comes from or, or how the water cooler effect you know, takes place. It sounds like you and the publishers are almost like venture capitalists. You're placing bets on a number of different people that are coming to you in the hopes that a few of those will be really big and you accept that many of them will, you know, dismal, but it may not be that bad. Um, but certainly, but that certainly for newer debut authors, I think publishers are, yes, betting on authors like horses. I mean, they are probably in most cases overpaying, but they hope that, you know, one or two horses kind of breaks away from the pack and kind of crosses the finish finish line for them and sort of wins the day. Whereas uh, as more established authors, you know, or authors who are already best-selling authors, it's much easier for a publisher to run their profit and loss statements because they can kind of predict what the numbers will be the second time around based on how, how good they were the first time. Where it becomes really odd to me is when they're trying to make a science of a bet where they take that same PL sheet that they feel is similar to another author they're acquiring. Let's say they're acquiring an author and they think to themselves, this author is a lot like a Malcolm Gladwell to me, or this author is a lot like a Noah Yuval Harari to me. And so they want to make an offer in accordance with that because that's what their profit and loss statement numbers are telling them. They're, they're still making a blind bet. Any way, you, uh, any way you boil it down, any way you look at it, you just can't predict. So that's the wildest thing to me about uh, the work we do. It's like uh, walking into a casino and spinning a roulette table. Well, let's take a couple of more questions uh, from Twitter. So we have a question. It sounds like the... It sounds like the agent is key for new authors. What about experienced or established authors? Is an agent essential in that case? 
let's say there was an established author who was a bestseller and they wanted to get certain things in their contract with the publisher, the author had their, their attorney go to a publishing house and ask for certain things in the contract. The publisher would say, that's nice, but we're not going to do that. You know, despite even sometimes how successful the author is, because there's nothing really to behoove the publisher. Whereas we publish so many books with that publisher over many, many years, and our business goes to the bottom line of that publishing house. So when we ask for something of a publisher or, you know, we refer a publisher back to our our boilerplate contract with the publisher, you know, they have to follow the preferred terms our clients get. So it's oftentimes even authors, you know, working without an agent who somehow they've got managed to get a deal with a publisher or they're hoping to get a, a good deal with a publisher, they're more often than not going to kind of get the standard vanilla boilerplate agreement the publisher gives to every author walking off the street. I have to assume that also uh, as an agent, you have you understand and have the context to know where the publisher has room and flexibility and you can push versus those points where you know you will the publisher will never ever give in. Oh, that's a very big piece of it. And it's interesting that you mentioned that too, because, you know, for instance, even an attorney who's speaking to a publisher and asking for certain things in the contract, unless they're an intellectual property attorney, and one, as it relates to the the quirks of book publishing, because the contract terms and the things that are fair and market value in, in book publishing are not the same as what they are in film and TV or other industries, you know, it can be sometimes detrimental when a, someone who, if they didn't know what they were doing, they were asking a publisher for certain things in a contract. Yes, that wouldn't be good. It's one of the reasons why publishers prefer to work with an agency. Uh, oftentimes, we'll reflect the deal terms back into the contract and then mirror the contract to, again, establish agreements we have with the publisher. And then we have, like many companies do, you know, a business affairs department that looks at these contracts on a daily basis. And so it's very second nature to them. And they kind of go through these contracts with a fine tooth comb and get the very best terms for our clients. We have another question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan. Arsalan's a regular listener. And I have to say, Arsalan's really smart because he watches these CXO Talk shows and he asks questions. And so each week he's asking questions of top experts in the world around the the, the shows that we have. So uh, kudos to Arsalan and thanks Arsalan for your great questions. And, and Arsalan is wondering, where does the, publish industry at the publishing industry at this point stand regarding the creation of NFTs, which is basically authentic, authenticity or ownership certificates, digital uh, digital ownership uh, for books in terms of sales and royalty, similar to digital art. Is that happening at all? Compared to other forms of media and other companies, book publishing is kind of a it's kind of a dinosaur that's uh, very reluctant to evolve. So, you know, I don't think. Whereas there have been a lot of advances in the industry. I mean, you look at audiobooks and they're they're way more intelligent now than they used to be. I mean, we went from kind of the I mean, there were even books on vinyl at one point, but we basically have gone from books on tape to now there's a technology called Whisper Sync where uh, you can be listening to your audiobook, let's say on your iPhone or your home stereo, and then the technology is smart enough that you leave your home so it follows you on your phone. You get into your car and then the audiobook starts playing on your car. Um, there are some kind of, I would say, ambitious companies um, from the world of tech who are uh, venturing into book publishing a bit to try subscription pricing and um, uh, what's the word of serializations in the digital space and to pay for those books actually using forms of Bitcoin or digital currency that they create within their own realm. One of the most exciting companies doing that right now is this company called Radish 
uh, who could be a nice company to look at. I think they were actually recently acquired by uh, this massive Korean internet company called Naver. It's basically their version of Google in Korea. Um, so there are some exciting things technology wise, I think happening on the sort of the fringes of book publishing, but the main formats pretty much continue to be, you know, the hardcover book, the trade paperback, the mass market, the ebook and the audio book, uh, both in digital. And I mean, for some reason, audio publishers are still making CDs. I don't know where they're being played other than in libraries or uh, maybe a, maybe a audio files somewhere, but um, those tend to be the main formats. Beth Albright on Twitter says, Hey, Mark, I'm a brand new client and I'm thrilled to be with you and thank you Trident. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of her. Yes, we just started working together. We're getting her book sent out on submission. She's a uh, writing in the suspense space. So um, terrific to, to work with Beth. And she's a USA Today bestselling author too, which is great. So here's another question for you. And again, for, for nonfiction, because that's our audience for, for the most part. So I have a book in me and I know I can, uh, I know it'll be a good book. Are you going to make me rich? Am I going to get rich by publishing this book? It could happen. You know, you have to, again, this is, um, it's like the casino. It's like walking into a casino anything can happen. Um, again, in the world of nonfiction, chances are like we talked about, you know, the advances, again, even on the high end for non-celebrity nonfiction, we're talking maybe mid to low six figures. But it's sometimes these books, which are just sort of the runaway bestseller, like, um, I hope I can say this on, on your show, but there's, this is actually the title of the book. It's called You Are a Badass, and it has this really bright yellow cover. It's sort of like a soft business book, um, and it had a very quiet publication. No one really expected this book to do much of anything, and it was with, you know, the maybe mid-sized publisher. Out of nowhere, it became a bestseller, I think, because the title was so raunchy, the cover was so bright, and then you started seeing it in every bookstore. So that's the probably a good example of the book where it had a modest advance, it had a quiet publication, but what it threw off in royalties was tremendous. Um, then there are other books which just get publishers so excited, they go far and beyond what we could ever hope for, you know, in terms of a book advance, although that can also put a lot of pressure on an author to try and earn their advance back with a publisher. You know, um, the, certainly the first thing a publisher is saying when they walk into an, uh, their, uh, their sales force meeting after they've acquired a book is we've paid X number of dollars for this book. How do we make our advance back? Uh, but if they don't, after the publication, it definitely makes doing book two much harder. So the pressure for the author to pay the advance back or to earn it back is the second book, since they're not obligated to return that advance if the book is not sold. Yeah, in no way is, is the author obligated to return the book advance, except obviously if they are in serious breach of their contract. For instance, let's say an author didn't deliver their manuscript or did really did not deliver it on time, or there was some other very serious breach of the contract. Then sometimes the publisher has to cancel the contract. The author has to return the book advance. But in the instance where the advance is all paid, and the book has published, no matter what, the author doesn't have to pay the money back. It's all I'm saying is because it's in advance against royalties, they will only see royalties if they sell enough copies of their book to effectively pay the advance back. So another, another question uh, relating to all this, I have this book in me and I want it, I want to position the book and have the book have the characteristics that will make people want it, make it fly off the shelves. Can you describe those characteristics? What works? The best thing an author who's trying to do that can, can do or think to themselves is they should look at the marketplace 
and really get a feel for what's working well in the marketplace. So one of the easiest things they could do is look at the bestsellers list within, for instance, let's say they're writing a nonfiction business book. They should look at that category within the New York Times bestsellers list, the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list, even the Amazon top 100. See what's climbing onto those charts because right away they know what's working well and what publishers will be looking for. Secondly, an author can, you know, or a hopeful writer looking to become a published author can look at the publishing list of any publishing house. Like they could go look at McGraw Hill's publishing list or Portfolio Sentinel or any of these, you know, nonfiction business book publishers at big five publishing houses, look at their catalogs, see what they're publishing. For instance, I would say an author who is, um, I think what I'm getting from what I'm seeing in the business book world is the style of doing business has changed. You know, uh, I think there was a time when things were very much about how loud you could be, how, not how maybe necessarily how obnoxious, although it did often come off that way, but a lot of it was driven by fear, uh, power, prowess. Now there's a lot of, um, the company culture has changed, I think, like out West and in, uh, there's a lot of work being done, for instance, in the diversity, equity, inclusion space in the business book world. People want to have their thoughts and feelings heard, this whole work from home thing. So all of that is changing the kinds of books which are being published. Obviously, there are still some business books which are kind of what I would call hard business books, which probably, you know, look at the, uh, the way of doing business, which is taught by business school. But then there are a lot of sort of softer business books like uh, Cheryl Strandberg's Lean In, which, you know, for the more general lay reader, which sometimes are much more commercially viable than books being published by the Harvard Business Review. So what about length? Can I write a short book? You can see, you can see where where I'm going with all of this. I'm a really busy guy, but I know I have a book in me and I want to get it out there with as least amount of work as possible. And I want to make as much money as possible. I mean, do you get authors coming to you very often with that mindset? Or is this just a, a complete fantasy and you just X that out and don't even look at it this way? I think in the world of nonfiction, there's actually a lot more flexibility, which is the interesting thing when it comes to page count, because I have a client now who we intended it to be a full length book, but the publisher loved the idea of doing it as maybe a 20 or 40,000 word book. So it could kind of be like a, a handbook you could give to employees and that they could easily digest it. Um, it gets tricky in other genres. Some of them are very, very strict. Obviously, the strictest probably being a children's picture book. You know, uh, uh, those tend to be 32 pages, 900 words on average, because you're telling a child a bedtime story. You have a window of time before you or the child falls asleep. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the attention span of the kids and all that. Um, typically, the normal, normal book length is 80 to 120,000 words. Now, you go outside of that by five or 10,000 words and you're fine. But what starts to happen, something strange starts to happen when you when you futz around with that in the world of fiction or nonfiction, the price of the book will change because publishers price books according to uh, page count, you know, their cost of shipping, warehousing, manufacturing. So a longer book will be more expensive. A cheaper book will be cheaper in terms of how it's priced. What happens is the margin for profit gets so small if you've written a 20 or 40,000 word book that it's harder for the publisher to make their numbers and then in turn the author to see much of a ROI on the, you know, in what they see in royalties. So um, it's something to consider. If you go very far beyond, you know, what's a normal book length, you know, going beyond 120,000 words, the book gets too expensive and you begin to lose customers and it sort of becomes the opposite problem, um, but with the same result. Um, so the sweet spot really for fiction and nonfiction, I think is 80 to 90,000 words. That's what authors should really aim for. Unless, you know, the publisher asks for something else or the audience might go for something else. And we have another question from Twitter. What, 
preparation should an inspiring author make to find and work with a literary agent or to ask another way, I want to approach you. How should I get, what do I need to do to get my ducks in a row? So you're going to look at me, however I get in contact with you, maybe over the transom on your website, and you're going to say, hmm, I need to talk to this guy. So I think a few things. One is you made sure you're speaking to the right person because let's say I'm an, I were an agent doing only women's fiction and you were coming to me with, I don't know, a business book or a science fiction novel, then I wouldn't be the right person. Um, that, that kind of goes without saying, uh, having written a great book, having put together a great proposal and sample chapters, but also having polished that work as much as you can. I wouldn't just write something and then throw it off the desk and send it out the window. It's like, it's, it's not just going to take flight immediately. So as much as you can, going back through the manuscript, editing the manuscript, some people use you know, freelance or outside editors before going into the publishing process to bring the manuscript as far as they can, or they might attend a writer's workshop or a writer's conference. Uh, workshop, I would say, is going to be a lot more focused on sort of the finer details of fixing the manuscript itself or fixing the proposal and sample chapters itself. A conference will be a lot more about sort of like what we're speaking about, learning the way around the industry, making connections, getting a better understanding of the inner workings and all that. Um, either way, I think those things are helpful. Uh, and then making yourself appealing to an agent is, again, if you're a writer of fiction, all the bells and whistles, you know, attending prestigious writers workshops, getting endorsements for your work, publishing in literary magazines and journals, things like that. In the nonfiction world, it's a little bit more like really beefing up the social media following or the newsletter subscribers, you know, or doing uh, publishing work online. Like if you have a piece, for, for instance, in the Huffington Post that goes viral and publishers suddenly want to approach you and get that book to uh, get that uh, written as a book, you know, that's fantastic. So in the world of nonfiction, it, it can sometimes be having to make sure that the cart isn't, you know, isn't in front of the horse you know, when it comes to the, the platform. A lot of authors of nonfiction, they, they, they write the chapters, they write the proposal, and then they think to themselves, oh, wait, I have to do this thing called constructing a platform? Well, let me get a book on that. And then it, they realize it takes time to do that. Is building the platform the harder part or is writing the book the harder part? Well, it depends, you know, um, what kind of person they are and, and where they are at in their career. Obviously, if there really is truly no platform there and having a dream one out of thin air is very hard to do. Um, if it happens, you know, magically or someone writes a, a tweet, which suddenly it's all over social media and they have a huge following, that's great if it happens organically like that. Other people, they toil over the writing of the manuscript and the proposal. Some authors even more so they struggle with the query letter because it's so concise and they're expansive in terms of the way they think. So really, I guess, depends on the person. Okay. Well, with that, we are pretty much out of time. I want to say a huge thank you to Mark Gottlieb. He's a literary agent with Trident Media Group. And Mark, I'm so grateful that you took the time today to be with us. Thank you. Michael, thank you. I enjoyed so much. Everybody. Thank you for watching, especially those folks who ask such insightful and excellent questions. Before you go, please subscribe to our newsletter and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out CXOTalk.com because we really have amazing guests coming up. Thanks so much, everybody. I hope you have a great day and we will see you next time.